The Mysterious Benedict Society by Trenton Lee Stewart Illustrated by Carson Ellis Read to you by Mr. Perez Open Sesame At lunchtime, Kate was tossing grapes into the air so high they almost struck the cafeteria ceiling and catching them in her mouth where they made a satisfying plonk. She did this without thinking, as it was an old habit with her always to toss grapes when she ate them. And so, although she might seem distracted, Kate was actually listening carefully to the boys as they told their experience in the whispering gallery. This was proven when Rainey said the Institute was going to close, and Kate, glancing down in disbelief, received a tonk on the forehead instead of a plonk in the mouth. It's true, Sticky said. Mr. Curtin foresees a call to greater duty in the near future. He warned us to keep it quiet. He'd already told us that one word about the whisperer gets your messenger status revoked, and believe me, no messenger wants to chance that. I suppose if he knew we were telling you this, he'd toss you out of the tower, Kate said, wiping grape juice from her forehead. He told us all this, Rainey said, because he's considering keeping us around after the change, the improvement, as he calls it, to be trained up as executives. He said we'd get to use the Whisperer once a week as a reward for our service. Is it really as great as all that? Constance said. Sitting in a chair doing nothing? Rainey and Sticky glanced at each other and quickly glanced away. Neither wished to admit how overcome he'd been by the experience in the Whisperer. In fact, Rainey had struggled not to sound excited or even fond when he described it to the girls. Did he really want to say aloud that Mr. Curtin's machine had made him feel, well, happy? Instead, Rainey changed the subject. It's exhausting, is what it is. That's why Mr. Curtin needs so many messengers. He alternates them to keep their minds fresh. Given the number of messengers, our turn should come again in about a week, assuming, oh, for crying out loud, there goes another one. The children scowled and clutched at their heads. Constance, though, looked not just annoyed, but perplexed, as if this were her first hidden message broadcast instead of her 13th. Constance, Rainey said, are you? Quiet, Kate hissed. Here comes a sash. Hello, George. Hello, Raynard, the messenger said, ignoring the girls. He was a stout boy with braces so heavily rubber-banded that his mouth looked like a cat's cradle. On behalf of the other messengers, I want to congratulate you and to invite you to join us at one of the messenger tables for meals. You know, to mess with the messengers, <laughs> said Rainey, as politely as possible. It wouldn't exactly help their mission to offend the other messengers, but neither did he wish to split up from Kate and Constance. He glanced at Sticky, who had a curious, expect expectant look on his face, as if he were really considering joining the messengers. What was he thinking? Thanks so much, Rainey said quickly, but do you have any concerns about stomach viruses? It may be a day or two until Sticky and I get over ours. Stomach viruses, said the boy. Stum, oh yeah, said Sticky, catching on. We spent most last night throwing up. It was bad, too. I felt like I was being turned inside out, but Rainy's too cautious. We're probably not contagious. We should go ahead and join you. He grabbed his tray and made as if to rise. Uh, no. No, I think Raynard's probably right, said the boy, backing away. He covered his mouth and spoke from behind his hand. You can never be too careful with these things. Why don't you fellas give it a few days, and when you feel obviously better, I mean 100%, then come over and join us. That's awfully nice of you, Rainey said, as the messenger hurried away. Quick thinking, Kate said. And you, Sticky. Pretty bold work. But what happened to the Sticky Washington I know? You know, the shy, timid one? Give me a break, Sticky said, ducking his head. Ah, there he is. Sticky tried to smile, but in truth, 
he was decidedly troubled. If Rainey hadn't spoke up just then, he wasn't sure at all what he would have done. He had actually wanted to join the messengers. Was that all it took to sway him, being asked? Did he want so much to be wanted that he would do, well, anything? It was as if the whisperer had opened a door, and now Sticky couldn't close it again. He was so ashamed he could hardly look up. Rainy, meanwhile, felt deeply disturbed. The more he thought about his response to the whisperer, the more convinced he was that becoming a messenger had been a bad development, a blow to their miss- mission rather than a boon, because he was too weak to handle it. He needed to get through the mission and off this island before he faced the whisperer again. His next turn probably wouldn't, ha- wouldn't come for several days, and yet already he found himself glancing at doors. Rainy cleared his throat. <clears throat> I think we need to... Please, Constance snapped, covering her ears. Rainy, will you please stop talking? Taken aback, Rainy closed his mouth and stared at her in surprise. What is your problem, Sticky said sharply. Constance lowered her hands and looked at Rainy with a mixture of ruefulness and irritation. Sorry about that, she said tersely. It's just that you've been on this whole time, and it's already getting old. One of you, maybe, but two of you, it's too much. On? Rainy repeated. Two of me? You know, Constance said, tapping her head. You're on the broadcast. It's you talking. The others looked at one another in amazement. Rainy was flabbergasted. Are you... Are you sure, Constance? I mean, I'm, I'm right here. Constance thumped the side of her head, as if trying to clear water from her ears. It's like you're in stereo. Wow, Kate said, impressed. This must be really weird for both of you. You know what this means, Sticky said. Mr. Curtin is recording the Whisperer sessions. He can record thoughts. But if he can do that, said Kate, then why does he need fresh messengers all the time? Why not just play his recordings? I think I know, said Rainey, finally recovering from his astonishment. He hasn't always been able to do it. Remember the modifications he wrote about in his journal? He said it, he said it this morning, too. He said the whisper was undergoing modifications. This explains why he's not going to need the messengers after the improvement, Sticky said. Once he's finished recording all his messages, he'll have no use for messengers anymore. And he'll be able to broadcast his recordings around the clock, said Constance. She sighed miserably and closed her eyes. That's just peachy. That wasn't all, Rainy thought. He had a strong suspicion as soon as Mr. Curtin had recorded his messages, he would boost them to full strength. It was all going to be part of the improvement. But for Constance's sake, Rainy decided not to mention this aloud. She was already frightened, no doubt. Sitting there, eyes tightly shut, anxiously wondering what lay in store for her, Rainy felt an itch in the back of his mind. He had recently felt the very same way himself, but his eyes hadn't been closed exactly. We're almost out of time, aren't we? Sticky was saying. I never thought we'd still be on this island when all the bad stuff happened. Of course, I hoped it never would happen. I wish we could be doing something, Kate said. If we could just figure out what Mr. Benedict... She paused. Rainy, why are you looking at Constance like that? Constance opened her eyes to find Rainy staring at her. Mr. Benedict said, with open eyes now, Rainy muttered, almost to himself, meaning before they were closed or blindfolded. Abruptly, he stood up. Quick, everyone. We still have time before class. Kate leapt to her feet. Her blue eyes twinkled with excitement. Where are we going? To find a place you must exit to enter. Moments later, the mysterious Benedict Society stood on the plaza, exactly where the boys had stood that morning when Jackson blindfolded them. A few students milled about in the rock garden, but there were no executives in sight. This is the spot, isn't it? Rainy asked. I'm pretty sure, said Sticky. 
who still wasn't sure what Rainy was up to. Rainy had been in too much of a hurry to explain. And how many steps did we take before we went inside? Sticky told him, and Rainy looked at Kate. Which door would that take us to? Kate asked Sticky to take a few steps while she watched. Then, one by one, she studied the Institute buildings. Finally, she shook her head. Based on the length of your stride, that many steps would take you to any door of any building in the whole Institute, front or back. Oh, Sticky said. Certainly, he had disappointed Rainy somehow. I'm sorry. I was so nervous, you know. I guess I must have misremembered. I don't think so, said Rainy, who, far from looking disappointed, was growing more and more excited. We left the plaza, remember? Went down a walkway, and then across grass. Grass? Sticky said. Hey, that's right. I was so anxious, I didn't even think about that. And you know what? It was the, sa- it was the same when Jilson took me to the waiting room. Rainy nodded. When Mr. Benedict said we must exit to enter, he meant we must exit the buildings to enter someplace else, a place we can't get to from inside. Kate's face broke into a grin. It's the traps, isn't it? The number of steps you took would bring you almost exactly to the one behind the Institute Control Building. But why would we want to enter the traps? Constance asked doubtfully. Not the traps themselves, Rainy said. Remember how we thought the boulders were there to help hide them? I think it's the other way around. The traps are there to keep us away from the boulders because the boulders are hiding secret entrances. Secret entrances? Constance said, trying not to look impressed. How did you think of that? Actually, I should have thought of it sooner, Rainy said. Sticky had already told me Jillison took him outside and blindfolded him. Obviously, the executives wanted to keep something hidden, something other than the waiting room. I mean, because no sane person would ever want to find that place. I'll bet you, and I'll bet you anything, the next line of Mr. Benedict's message was going to be something like, where one of you has been before. Sticky was mystified. But how would Mr. Benedict know? They're watching the Institute through their telescopes, remember? And the plaza's in plain sight of the mainland. They must have seen Jillson blindfold you and take you behind the Institute control building. That's how Mr. Benedict knew about it. So, you mean something good came out of that? Sticky asked, his eyes suddenly shining with tears. I didn't go to the waiting room for nothing? You aren't going to actually start crying on us, are you? Asked Constance rudely. Not now, Sticky growled, removing his spectacles and wiping his eyes. I believe you've cleared me right up. Anyway, Rainy said, the passages that lead to the waiting room and the whispering gallery may also lead somewhere else, somewhere important. We need to get inside and find out. So, what's next? Kate asked. Sneak around to the boulders behind the building? We still have a few minutes before class. Rainy considered. I think the ones up behind the dormitory would be safer. There's too much activity down here. Safer is good, Sticky said. Kate was bouncing on the balls of her feet. So, what are we waiting for? The right moment, Rainy replied. As it happened, Rainy had a particular right moment in mind. The moment... The day's classes had ended, when all the recruiters and most of the executives would be in the gym, marking the steps of their eerie dance. There would be far less of a chance of bumping into somebody in in the secret passages, he pointed out. But they would only have a few minutes. They needed to hurry. Luckily, hurrying was something at which Kate excelled. By the time the others had made it halfway up the hill to the stretch of path, nearest the drapeweed patch. Kate had already reached the hilltop well above them. A quick check to make sure no one was coming up from the other side of the hill, a quick scan of the plaza to see if anyone was looking this way, then Kate gave the all-clear sign, and the others ran over 
over to hide behind the boulders. A minute later, she joined them. We found the entrance, Sticky told her, pointing to a barely detectable outline in the stone. The question is how to open it. We've already tried pushing it, sliding it, and begging it. No luck. Open sesame, Constance cried, then scowled at the unmoving boulders as if she hated them. At the moment, Rainy wasn't particularly fond of them either. He hadn't considered that it might be difficult getting into the secret entrances once you found them. Now, here they stood, thwarted, while precious seconds ticked away. Kate glanced around to be sure they couldn't be seen, but Mr. Curtin had placed the entrance very carefully. The back of the boulders couldn't be seen from anywhere below, not from any window or door in the Institute. The same was true for the boulders behind the Institute control building. If students stayed on the paths and walkways, as they were supposed to, they would never spot an executive using a secret entrance. Rainy, meanwhile, was casting about for a hidden lever or knob, anything that might open the door. Finding nothing, he growled, Come on, we don't have time for this. He gave the door a frustrated kick. To the amazement of all, the stone door immediately swung open and away, revealing an open archway. You kick it? Sticky cried incredulously. Rainy nodded, finally understanding. Mr. Curtin likes to ram through doors, he said. Have you noticed? The children hurried through the archway into a small, empty foyer. The wall swung closed behind them, and immediately a light came on overhead. It was so bright they almost had to squint. Before them, an equally bright passageway curved around in a steep descent. Rainey had thought to post Constance near the entrance as a lookout, but he saw that the lookout was pointless. After the passage curved away from the foyer, it descended for quite some distance uninterrupted by other doorways or passages. If someone came through the foyer, there'd be no place for the lookout to hide. The children had no choice but to keep together and hope for the best. Quickly, quietly, they moved down the passage. Constance was riding piggyback, Kate and Rainy were tiptoeing, and Sticky, who was bad at tiptoeing, he brought his knees rather too high so that he always looked and sounded like a prancing horse, carried his shoes and walked silently in his socks. In the bright light, with no nooks or crannies to duck into, they all felt quite vulnerable. Near the bottom of the hill, they came upon another passage that branched off to their right and slanted steeply downward. They wouldn't need to investigate it, though. They knew at once where it led. A remarkably foul odor hung in the air, and the passage descended to a lonely black door with an iron padlock. Near the door, the stone floor was slick with black mud, and from beyond it came a high-pitched humming noise punctuated with little clicks and scratches. Rainy turned. Sticky stood a few p paces behind him, trembling and closing his eyes. Let's move on, Rainy said quickly. He and Kate took Sticky by the arms. Just as his knees appeared ready to buckle, he leaned on them gratefully as they hurried on. A dozen paces more, and the children had come to another passage that branched off to the left. This one led to a simple metal door. Regaining his composure, Sticky quit leaning on Kate and Rainy and set his shoulders. Whatever the door concealed, he wanted to confront it bravely, or at least more bravely than he'd handled the waiting room. And so, while Kate and Constance looked questioningly at Rainy, who seemed hesitant to be the one to open it, Sticky took the opportunity to press forward and gave the door a sharp kick. This produced a sound very much like that of a hammer coming down upon a finger. Sort of a dull donk. And Sticky fell to the floor, clutching his foot. Rainy pointed to the numeric keypad beside the door. It's not like the outside doors, he whispered. It's locked. Sticky winced and put his shoes back on. So much for regaining composure. What's that? Kate said, pointing to a piece of paper stuck to the wall above the door. It looks like a note. Here, Constance, let me lift you up. In a moment, Constance had the note. Printed in distinctive, awkward handwriting, it read, 
Lose the new code? Turn over for new code. At the bottom of the paper, there was an arrow pointed down. The children sucked their breath. Could it be as simple as this? Could they be so lucky? Eagerly, Rainy flipped over the paper. On the back was another note, this one in different handwriting. Attention all executives. You cannot leave notes like this. SQ. This had better be gone by tonight. Stop trying to be clever. Jackson. I knew it was too good to be true, said Constance. I don't get it, Sticky said. Why would SQ say turn over for code if he wasn't going to write the code on the back? It's SQ, remember? said Kate. Maybe he forgot to write it. My question is why Jackson didn't take the note down himself. And miss a chance to scold SQ in front of the other executives, Constance said. Good point, Kate said. Rainy was trying to study the note. There's something... The others looked at him expectantly. He rubbed his chin. Well, why did Jackson tell him not to try to be clever? Because Jackson knows it's pointless for SQ to try, said Constance. But he did try. That's what Jackson's saying. So the question is, what did SQ do that he thought was so clever? Surely it wasn't reaching, uh, leaving the note up so high. It was hard to reach, maybe, but not hard to spot. Kate read the note over again. Okay, why does he capitalize L-O-S-E and O-B-E-R? It's not just for emphasis, is it? I think it's to call attention to them, Rainey said. There's something special about them, he trailed off, considering. Well, both words have four letters, Sticky offered, hoping somehow that this was a helpful thing to point out. Maybe the code's in invisible ink, Constance suggested. With invisible ink, he could have just written the code on the front, Rainey said. What would be the point in turning the note over? You think everything SQ does has a point, Sticky said. Suddenly, Rainey stifled a laugh. Wait a minute, I have it. Turning the note over is the point, SQ, you devil. Uh, Rainey, said Kate, we did turn it over, remember? There's nothing there. We turned to the back of the paper, said Rainey. SQ didn't mean that. He meant turn the note upside down. I still don't get it, Sticky said. Think of it this way. What if the note read, is lose the new code? The answer is yes, but you have to turn it over. Rainy turned the note upside down and pointed to the word lose. The letters were now numbers. Three, five, zero, seven. Hey, that is clever, said Sticky. For SQ, I mean. We're just lucky he's not clever enough to remember the code without leaving notes, Rainy said. The note was returned to its proper place, and the children prepared themselves. Now that they'd had a moment's pause, their minds filled, filled up with questions. What would they find behind the door? What if it was terrifying? Or what if it was exactly what Mr. Benedict needed? Or what if, this had suddenly occurred to Rainy, what if SQ's note had been left there on purpose? to trick sneaking children like themselves. Rainy saw a troubled look on Kate's face. Had it occurred to her too? Mr. Curtin suspected another snoop on the island. That's why he changed the door codes, after all. So what if... We need to think about this, Rainy whispered. But Kate was already reaching for the keypad. No time for thinking. He's coming. He? Dickie repeated. That was why Kate's expression had changed. She had heard something, and now Rainy and the others heard it too. Down the main passage, growing louder by the second, an electric whine, a shifting of gears, it was Mr. Curtin. They had no choice but to go through this door, even though Rainy had no answer to his last burning question. What if it is a trap? Oof, another good chapter. This story just gets better and better. Tomorrow we will be reading 
practice makes perfect. So I hope, uh, I hope they don't get caught. We'll have to find out. And I hope everybody out there is doing well, staying healthy. Remember to keep washing your hands. Be helpful. Be patient. Be kind. We will see each other soon. Take care.